The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Welcome back to the Dominion Podcast. Welcome back. Episode number... Nine? Season season two. Season two, yeah. Season two, man. It's episode nine, pretty sure. If not, whatever. Forgive me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Glad to have you back. Thanks for coming back. Even after the last episode with Steve North, we apologize that we had to show such things on our channel. <laughs> 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 you know, he's not too bad to look at. Not you know? too bad. Not too bad. Did you enjoy that episode, by the I way? I did. I like yeah. the... Uh, Dominion Minute we threw up there. Yeah, we got to get some more of those going. Just, just a little interview with a solid brother All doing right. his thing. We got a couple more ideas uh, for solid brothers we need to get up in here for a little 10, 15 minute interviews. Yeah. We'll make it happen. Yep. How's your week going? Uh, yeah. What's it, Thursday? <laughs> it was good. Question. And uh, we had our history day at the unofficial official sponsor, That's right. the Classical Christian That's School. Right. And uh, every year we do history day. And the staff do a great job. They, you know, they they contribute a lot extra this day where the students dress up. They prepare speeches based on a historical character, and they they spend weeks preparing, researching, preparing, nice. writing, and delivering these speeches. But then we just make the day of it. So the whole school is transformed into different stations. We have a banqueting table where we lunch together, nice. and uh, different stations where they go over different. Um, you know, historical matters. And it's just a fun, a fun day. Do even the young kids participate? Oh yeah, all the kids. Nice. So the kindergartens don't actually um, speak speeches, but they dress up and, and today they were paired off with an older student. Nice. And to be honest, one of the, the great things about this is part of a classical education, um, the goal of a classical education uh, the climactic phase is a is the rhetoric is the capacity to um, in writing and particularly speaking to defend the truth, and so what we do early on is um, we try to cultivate a uh, the skill of public speaking, mm. and what's awesome is that I mean these children as young as grade one so whatever that is six years old are giving public presentations and this isn't this isn't uncommon at the school i mean i remember delivering my first speech i believe my first speech was grade seven well wow. when they mandated it there had, i think there had been presentations before that maybe very rare and certainly not like a speech speech and um even to see the students who are temperamentally very shy uh, when everyone is doing it and everyone is encouraging and it's not, it's not meant to be um, some, it's not purely an assessment. Like it's a fun thing. Yeah. You develop a comfort with that, mm. which is very good. I mean, um, so by the time our students, Lord willing, get to grade seven, they're going to be excellent orators. I mean, our grade fours, if you get to grade four now in our school, multiple students in grade four, actually in grade three, memorized their whole speech, yeah. delivered wow. it. Great. Shout out to the black boys. They did a great job. Yeah. Peter and, and yeah. Mark. Peter and Mark. And um, yeah, so it's just, it's really encouraging to see, yeah. you know, when you set up our high for students, they actually want to rise to the occasion. They can rise to the occasion. Mm. And I mean, these, these students are going to get to, um, you know, high school, of course. And by the time they even get to high school, they'll be very confident and comfortable speaking. And hopefully by the end of high school, they'll be very capable in articulating themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a character thing, right? It's not just about skill. It's actually public speaking is very nerve wracking. Yeah. I mean, most people. I couldn't stand it in high school. Yeah, that's fine. Did you, did you find that? So, I mean, a big part of what we're getting over is the comfort level with discomfort. Yeah. That's a huge thing in character development in every area of your life. It's you need to become comfortable being uncomfortable mm-hmm. and to push through that with God's help and to deal with the the, the sins and the failures that come around mm-hmm. that. And that's how you refined. 
I don't know how it was for you, but I always, I hated speeches, but I was always fine being the class clown. Like I was, it wasn't that I didn't want to be singled out. Right. Cause I, I singled myself out all the time. Right. Doing something stupid or saying yeah. something funny. Right. Or getting on stage and playing music. I had no problem doing that. Yeah. I was going to ask you, you don't, but uh, yeah, there was never a problem with that. But for some reason, like having to deliver information was a whole different thing. Huh? Yeah. It, it puts you in a, maybe a vulnerable spot. Like yeah. you're more comfortable in the other areas, but yeah, this you can you're hide not behind something. Yeah. yeah. So when you're when you're doing something you're not great at in front of people, it's mm. nerve wracking. But that's great, and yeah, I'm just proud of all the students. So if you want your uh, son or daughter to be the next Winston Churchill, sons or daughters, yes, yeah, sons. If you've got daughters. lots of kids, especially, yeah. come on down. Exactly. We got down. a bulk pricing for our families. We actually do. We're yeah. announcing that tonight at that's our. Right. Uh, Parent board meeting, so. <laughs> education in bulk. Yeah. That's right. Costco education. <laughs> so, yeah. So shout out to Principal Auger. And, That's right. And all the staff and faculty at Quartha Classical. They're doing a great job. Yeah. Want to shout out to our official sponsor? Yeah. Yeah. The Folklorist. Yeah, the Folklorist. He, uh, he dropped a new single last week. Yep. You can check out his YouTube channel. That video was great. Yeah. Yep. So he did a video that went along with it. He actually just uh, released a website, upper40.com, and you can go to it and you can actually purchase a single that he produced, uh, he wrote and produced for the documentary, Antichrist and His Ruins. So if you've seen the, the documentary and you want to get the single that was in the beginning and the end of it, uh, it's a great single. You can purchase it there. You can purchase his latest single, uh, which is awesome and timely, kind of a commemoration of a lot of the things that happened around the Freedom Convoy um, and just the the freedom movement in our country. And um, yeah, check that out, upper40.com. Um, and stay tuned there. He's got He's always working on stuff. Always cooking in the kitchen. That's right. When he's not working or raising a bunch of kids. Yeah. You know, he's making music. Serenading his wife. When he's not wife. cleaning his guns. Yeah, cleaning his guns. <laughs> to, definitely today his his son, you know, was had a rifle as a prop and gets to the front and definitely takes off the cover of the bayonet, you know? And I'm like, yep. that's such a boy thing. It's like, it's not real until you can see it, you that's know? Right. <laughs> but yeah, shout out to the folklores. Thanks for the studio space. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're very grateful. Beautiful spot. So the last thing I want to say before we get into the topic for this week is um, we don't always announce how people can reach out to us and where they can find us online. So, Oh, you want people to reach out to us? I thought that's why we didn't say anything. I mean, yeah, our lives will probably change a lot. With fame comes great responsibility. (laughs) Listen, if you got complaints, just keep them to yourself. Just keep them to yourself. (laughs) We will straight up delete those. Like. Of all the Deleted. things, yeah, of all the things in our life we're involved with and the trouble that we take on, <laughs> angry comments is not one of them. Yeah, I could, in good conscience, delete one of those emails. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if you want to follow and subscribe, dominionpress.substack.com is probably the best place. We do have a Twitter account at Press Dominion. Um, we usually put the episodes up there. And uh, YouTube. I mean, a lot of people listen to this on podcasts. We have more listeners um, audio uh, through Apple or Spotify or whatever, wherever you listen to your podcast. But um, you can watch and share YouTube as well if you want to like and subscribe to that. And lastly, you can send your glowing comments, your undying affirmations to jeremy at dominionpodcast.ca. That's right. The dominionpodcast.ca. The dominion? I believe it's the dominion. Jeremy at the dominionpodcast.ca. That's right. Hopefully it's .ca and not .com. I can't remember. Well. Try them both. You know? try, try both. Just don't <laughs> make it both. too private. <laughs> we, don't even, we don't actually have a website at that address, do we? No, we don't. No, we don't. I didn't think so. It's all at the Substack. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into it. What do we want to talk about today? Well, we thought we would talk about prayer. That's right. And you had been doing some studying on this. Did you deliver your teaching on this yet or you're working on Uh, it? This Sunday. So by the time this episode comes out, I will have already done the class on it. But yeah, our Sunday school, we're going through the fundamentals of the faith uh, course and we're on the uh, eighth lesson on prayer this week. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Well, you brought up the idea of discussing prayer, and I thought that we could talk about prayer specifically in light of the dominion, um, the task of dominion that God has given to humanity that we have failed at, but in Christ that task is restored to us. And um, this is something not only that you're working on as a church, that our elders and our congregation has been really... um, seeking to work on and grow in as a congregation too. And so, I mean, a little bit of a backstory to this. I don't know if I've said it before on the pod, but um, we went to a conference in November at Trinity um, Bible Chapel in Waterloo region. And uh, that's Pastor Jacob Rayom. And um, the context of the conference was, um, to discuss Antichrist and his ruin, and that we they launched the documentary there. But really, it was a coming together, a, an opportunity for a lot of the pastors, but a lot of the congregants. Um, I, I mean, there is over 600, close to 700 or more people. Mm-hmm. It was a ton of people. So primarily lay people, just from churches who had, um, I would say, exercised a costly obedience in the last few years. And it was a time of fellowship. It was a time of kind of coming through a very intense season. Um, although we'd seen great victories, it was a battle and mm-hmm. there are losses and um, it wasn't easy. And so it was, it was wonderful to meet um, a lot of the men. And and honestly, I didn't even talk to a lot of the pastors. Um, I'm not someone who, I don't go to conferences and like try to meet people like the speakers. Um, but I had a lot of conversation with our listeners. A lot of listeners came and talked to me, which is super yeah, encouraging. Very encouraging. And um, one of the highlights, it was the best conference I've ever been to. So it was the least conferency conference I've ever been to. It felt like a revival meeting with preaching, with meal fellowship. Like it, it felt like... It was like a church, like the best of Christian It's just fellowship. extended fellowship. Yeah, just yeah. extended fellowship and uh, really well organized. Um, but the opening talk was given by Steve Richardson. And for those who don't know, we would love to have Steve on. Yeah. Um, but Pastor Steve recently, he was pastoring a Presbyterian church that stayed open during lockdowns and, and publicly... Um, stated their support for men like Jacob when they were undergoing, when they were taking a lot of criticism. And I hadn't heard Pastor Steve preach before, um, but I know people who have, and they were just so blessed by his preaching. Mm-hmm. This guy, he's, he's a modern Puritan. If you know him, I, I'm, I'm hoping we can get him on soon. He loves the Puritans. So him and Josh are good buddies, Josh Mills? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, they know each other. Yeah. And, uh, but Mills, yeah, Mills is definitely the younger Puritan for yeah. sure. Um, but his talk on the, on the opening night was basically on revival. And, um, it was immediately followed by a one hour prayer service, which is uncommon mm-hmm. in conference. And where we, it was a, le- a prayer that was led by a, a bunch of different pastors who would read scripture and then lead the people in prayer according to scripture. And um, I felt, and and Ben, our other elder who was there, and, and um, I'm sure all of our elders and leaders and many others felt that that was some of the most powerful time at the whole weekend. And God really did work and did move. And we came away thinking that we really need to reorient and reprioritize the place of prayer in our life and ministry. And... Um, so when we came back, you know, as as pastors, you always have a list of ongoing challenges. Mm-hmm. They could be administrative things. They could be, you know, vision things. They could yeah. be pastoral issues with people. Um, they could be leadership, team stuff, whatever it is. It just seems like there's constant needs, mm-hmm. things to be praying for. And I think the temptation as a leader, one of the temptations is to kind of get to work, right? Talk about it, make a plan, implement the plan. And uh, this isn't, that in itself is not a Christian way of doing things. 
And so we came back and we devoted a month. We we literally took a we had a spreadsheet of things we have to deal with. And we just said, we're going to not look at this spreadsheet for a month. I mean, I mean, immediate things. Like if people come to us, we'll of yeah, course yeah. talk to them. But things that require decisions, yeah, um, we're going to say on principle, we're going to take a month. When we meet as elders, we'll keep it brief. We'll do an update for ourselves and how we're doing with the Lord and ask for prayer, um, encouragement, confession, this type of thing. But we're going to just devote ourselves to praying for these things. And I have to say, I mean... Um, We've just seen the Lord work. I mean, a member of our congregation just started up a Friday night prayer service at their house um, every Friday night indefinitely, where we come and, you know, he opens with a two-minute devotion. There's no talking. There's no chit-chat. And we pray for 45 minutes to an hour. And we had an awesome turnout to that. Mm. And it's been going every Friday. And... um you know, the prayer before the service has been better and better attended. And I remember the first week after we kind of did this, looking at when I was preaching and seeing someone who we've been praying for, who hasn't been for weeks, um, just sitting there in the service. And I just had this overwhelming feeling that it was in response to God's prayer, Mm -hmm. to our prayer to God, rather. And, And the elders felt the same. Like they had that initial, their first reaction upon seeing them was, wow, you know, the Lord's working. Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted to maybe talk, touch on some scriptures and just to encourage our listeners. Um, we often bring up a lot of issues inside and outside of the church that we feel Christians have a duty to respond to, that Christians certainly have a duty to be faithful in light of. And we just want to drive home today that the fundamental duty of every Christian is to pray. Yeah. And the um, kind of most basic task in our responsibility to take dominion is praying. Yeah. And the, I mean, the encouragement is that every Christian can do this, right? That there's, you, you may think looking at it, the landscape, like what, what can we even do here? And the answer to that in one level is absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, this is a, this is a battle that we can't win. I think one of the reasons I on our own, and so it's funny you bring up my lesson that I'm preparing for. Um, I was talking to Pastor Jason this morning about it, and and uh, it's one of those things where I'm preparing this lesson, and I'm like, I have no business doing this. Yeah, you know, like I am of all people the last person that should be <laughs> telling people how how and off and you know, how often and what their prayers should be like, and getting up and doing teaching on this is just so convicting. And trying to diagnose the reason why I've always had trouble with this, I think it comes down to the sense that when you pray, you're giving up control, you're acknowledging your own incapable nature, your own inabilities. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a real pride thing there for me particularly, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's like this for a lot of people. Um, But yeah, I mean, when you look out, you see, well, what can I do? Like, well, nothing in my own strength, mm-hmm. right? But we're not we're not commanded to go out and single-handedly change things mm-hmm. in our own power, mm-hmm. right? We're supposed to, like you said, duty number one is prayer. And, and this is something everybody can do. You don't have to be super spiritual. You don't have to know everything about biblical theology. You know, it's about a dependence. And uh, if you do it the way the Bible do, uh, says to do it, it's really quite simple. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at the Lord's Prayer as a, as a template almost and and sort of follow that and just be humble. Yeah, the illusion of self-sufficiency is part of human pride and it, the old I mean we see this all over scripture, right? Um but we see Israel constantly tempted even in their their wanting a king, for example, mm-hmm. uh that they're not they're not trusting the Lord to protect them. That they say we want a king like the other nations. He's got to be tall and handsome. You know, he's got to lead us out into battle. Yeah. In other words, we're not we're not trusting that the Lord will keep His promise to protect us. Um, you know, we we see um, 
the prohibition against gathering and manna for two days, you know, and mm-hmm. and the temptation is okay. The Lord's provided miraculously, but I don't trust Him to provide the next day. Yeah, and so I'm just going to hoard this to myself, or um, you know, don't trust in chariots, mm-hmm. you know, but trust in the Lord. And, and and the modern application is don't trust in the strength and the power of your nation. And as we experience this in the West, I mean, the individual and the individual household has more power and um, autonomy and self-sufficiency, like electricity and indoor plumbing and medicine and cars for transportation. Like we, we are so not vulnerable comparatively to the world historically, Mm -hmm. but we can easily put our confidence in those things. We can easily think that we are secure. Yeah. Because of these things, I think there's also within the church a very pragmatic corporate approach to the congregation. So when you lead in a church, it's viewed less like a family, a spiritual family, and more like an organization. And so the wise and prudent thing to do is to adopt kind of practical um, um, policies and and ways of acting that are maybe appropriate in business, but not appropriate. Mm. For for the family or the church family, um, but but not even for business. Like a Christian businessman should be defined by prayer, and just as a farmer prays for rain for the crops for growth, Christian businessmen should be praying for his labors to bear fruit. Yeah, praying for wisdom, praying that God would guard him against the the temptations of sin that are unique to his vocation. Right, like yeah. every Christian, whether you're in business or in Christian ministry or a mother or a plumber or, you know, HVAC installer, like our, our labor should be seasoned with prayer. Um, this Psalm 127 is one that we repeat very often in our congregation. And we read this, um, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain, Mm -hmm. unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up, early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Mm. I think for me, um, and and what's plain in this text, is the antithesis to a prayerful life is an anxious life. And so one of the litmus tests for our own soul, am I prayerful enough? It's like, well, are you anxious? Mm. Right? Um, There's a kind of anxiety that a godly person will feel. Paul says, I felt an anxiety for all the churches. Anxiety simply, in that context, means a concern. Right. So it, the opposite of anxiety is not indif- indifference. That's that's just sinful passivity and a lack of love. If you care for people, you will have a concern. But here it is a fretful kind of concern. It is a concern that doesn't think that the Lord guards the city, but rather that we are on our own doing that, and therefore... Um, you know, need to keep our eyes open at every minute. Mm-hmm. I think sleep is just a God-given reminder that we don't run the world. That's right. Like, you, you think about it, it's weird. It's like, you know, a third of our life, we literally close our eyes and are unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> Powerless, yeah. unproductive. You know, things are going on in our body. Maybe that's analogous too. Like our body's rebuilding in that time. Yeah, there's the analogy in scripture of the farmer who sows the seed and lays his head down on the yes. pillow, but... You know, he's not actually causing anything to happen. No, he's God just gives throwing, growth. Yeah, God gives the growth. He he plants the seed and the earth yields its fruit, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so prayer is an acknowledgement that we are totally dependent on the Lord, that we are not self-sufficient, and that God needs to work in all of our labors to produce the fruit mm-hmm. that he desires. Uh, what, what And whatever vocation that is, whether we're staying at home, whether we're in the workforce, whether it's in the church, whether it's amongst our family, um, the temptation is to uh, to labor or to um, work for the bread of anxious to- of anxious toil, mm-hmm. and um, there, there's it's a, it's a dead end life, and it's it's no wonder that our culture that has rejected God and therefore prayer is is characterized by anxiety. Yeah. Like despite all we have, right? Despite all of the free, despite all the drugs and the psychotherapy, yeah, and, yeah. and it's still it's just a paralyzing anxiety. 
Um, I wanted to touch on relating to the theme of dominion, how and why prayer is so important. And I think about the words of Jesus when he taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, um, verses 9 and 10. He says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, the task of dominion that was given to God's image bearers, to humanity, in Genesis 1, 26, we read about this, essentially means to reflect and represent God in the world by living under his rule and ruling over creation in his name. That's why we say dominion is living under and ruling over. And um, this task of taking dominion, it has to be stated, cannot be, um, is not possible apart from prayer. We cannot be successful in the task of dominion and the purpose we have as humans apart from prayer. And what we see Jesus teaching us um, is a fundamental reorienting of our lives uh, and a prayer for the world to follow suit, to have their lives reoriented around the honor of God's name. And um, essentially, this is a prayer for dominion. So, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What that means is cause your name to be hallowed. Hallowed means revered or honored. So, it's a prayer that God's name would be honored or revered in the world. Yeah, And this is important because um, God requires of humanity as creator and as redeemer that humanity glorify him and give thanks to him. See, and, and as we see in Romans 1, the fundamental problem of humanity is their failure to give thanks to God, mm -hmm. their failure to glorify him, and instead ascribe to themselves um, and the work of their hands, things that God did, right? So we worship the creation rather than the creator. Well, what this is, is a, is a reorienting around revering God's name, honoring God, giving thanks and glorifying him for being God, and honoring and revering ourselves. That's what that is. That's mm -hmm. what idolatry is. So in the beginning of this prayer is a prayer that God um, would cause his name to be hallowed basically reorient the world around his rule. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What happens when God's name is truly honored and revered? He's obeyed. His His word is obeyed and he's mm -hmm. trusted. And um, people submit to his rule and rule over creation in his name. Well, that's what the kingdom is. And so a lot of people miss this. They, they reduce the Lord's prayer to a kind of privatized, thing, right? And it is it, it is always personal that you pray these things, but we're praying that God's name uh, would be revered throughout all the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think we need a recovery of this. You know, there's a very real yeah. sense in which the pietism which plagues Canadian evangelicalism is very privatized. We believe in missions, you know, we'll send missionaries out, but we don't we we don't have a comprehensive view of God's name and, and God being revered in his kingdom. Yeah. And his will being done on earth. There's it's, a connection with the Great Commission in yeah. here too, right? Yes. As uh you know, I guess you could say the Lord's prayer is our prayer that the Great Commission would would succeed. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's two sides of the same coin. We're saying, Lord, do this. And then the commission is God saying, okay, now you do this. You yeah. know, like I am going to do this and it will be through this. Romans 10, how will they um, hear unless someone sent to them? Yeah. Like it is through the preaching of the gospel that sinners are transformed from rebels, from dead people to living people to saints and family and friends of God. And they actually can hallow his name. Mm -hmm. They can revere him as holy. They can honor his name. They can submit to him as their king. Um, so we just we just want to start out by saying that the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus told all Christians to pray, is to reorient their lives around his kingdom. Yep. And that kingdom extends over 
all on earth as it is in heaven, Mm -hmm. not in my heart as it is in heaven, merely. It begins there. Not even in our church as it is in heaven, not even in our block or city over the earth. Mm -hmm. And um, Christians need this vision. And, And I think as well to... To have a lesser vision than the kingdom of God over all the earth is actually not to revere God's name. It's not to treat him like he is the God of the universe, the creator of all things, to whom each person owes their allegiance and loyalty and love and devotion. It's like you're, you know, unintentionally treating him like a tribal deity. Yeah. You know, like, oh, this is the God of that area, the God of this area. Which is how. Uh, the whole world thought in the Old Testament time. Exactly. And you read, like, there was a deity for this area and a deity for this area. Yes. And they didn't believe that deity was, you know, God of everything, just yeah. of the hills or the mountains or the valleys or yes. the water or whatever. But, the you know, the Jewish faith was Yahweh is Lord of all. Yes. You know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so yeah. that was the cry of the prophets, too, was like, this is going to go out to the nations. Yes. And it was, you know, it wasn't as much of a message as it was that they needed to repent uh, and turn back to Yahweh. But that was the goal is that so the nations may see, right? Yes. Yeah. It was always world domination, world yeah. dominion. The rather. coastlands wait yeah. for his law, right? This idea that the God's law is going to go out to all the peoples. Yes. In far away places. Yes. He is, yeah. he is the true and living God. He is not like these, these tribal deities, which are, um, relegated to some corner of creation that he's mm-hmm. the God over all creation. Love that story in um, the old Testament in the Northern kingdom where the uh, Syrians come and attack mm. the, uh, the Israelites, the Northern kingdom. And uh, they, what do they fight in the mountains first and they lose and they say, well, that's because their God's a God of the mountains. So yes. we got to fight him in the plane next yes. time. And then they come and fight them in the plane and they lose again. And <laughs> yeah. What's, what's, what's the story here? Yeah. It's that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. And um, so we need to pray that God's name is honored and revered everywhere by everyone. Yeah. That, that's our desire as Christians. And anything less than that is a, is a problem with our view of God. Mm-hmm. And um, we need to pray that his will is done on earth as is, is it is in heaven. Now, that begs the question, which is why we, we discuss the things we do week in and week out on this podcast, is, well, what is God's will on earth? You know, what is his will for the plumber? What is his will for the politician, for the pastor, for the congregant, for the mother, for the father, for the... What is his will in every area of life? Um, again, the Great Commission, uh, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded, Right? Um, yeah. Not 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 some things to some people, but everything to everyone. So, when we pray, we are reorienting ourselves around God's kingdom, around His name being honored and revered. And one of the practical benefits is that we ourselves are transformed. Mm-hmm. So it's not purely that we are asking. This is what we're asking the Lord to do. We are we are asking the Lord to do this. Our Father to do this. Um, but when we when we neglect prayer, inevitably what happens is our hearts wander and we end up orienting ourselves around our kingdom and around our name. There's a even for those who are born again that the flesh um, desires to reign, you know we, and we need to not let sin therefore reign in us, but it wants to. And so part of the purpose of ongoing prayer in the Christian life is just to keep us, keep our posture humble, keep our mm-hmm. desires desiring what God wills. Yeah. That's the key. Is that's the key. Aligning our will with his will. Yeah. And uh, that's quite clear in, in John chapter 14, where it talks about asking anything in my, if you ask anything in my name, mm-hmm. I will do it for you. Yeah. Uh, but even there, Jesus is talking about how his will is submitted to the father's will. Yeah. And we're supposed to do the same. Right? Yeah. 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 As it piggybacks on last week, we talked about repentance mm-hmm. and, and you know, the Christian duty, you know, our response ought to be repentance, that there's no political solution that's going to work apart from repentance. Mm-hmm. Well, prayer is oftentimes beneath repentance. I think back to um, 
Pastor Steve's exhortation, and he just mentioned various revivals throughout history, and they were characterized by prayer. Prayers, I mean, when people are praying on Mass, the Lord is already working, but often God works to produce prayer before an even greater work, right? Right, because it's because then it's seen to be His work, right? Yeah. When He leads people to pray, what's happening is He's leading people to depend on Him, such that when He works, no one goes, "Well, we did that." Yeah. Right. It's like, why does He whittle down the army, the Gideon's army? You know, why does He send David with a stone? Why does He not have armor? And He said, "Well, it's because when a little shepherd boy goes and takes out a battle-tested giant with a stone." The, the the most reasonable thing to conclude that you ought to conclude is that truly the God that man's God is God, right? Yeah. Like look what just happened. Or when three hundred take out thousands, or when trumpets take down the walls of Jericho, mm-hmm. or when a man dies and rises yeah. from the dead. Like you're in all of these things, God is producing a weakness in us so that he can manifest his power. And prayer is that. Prayer is actually us just becoming, is acknowledging our weakness and making ourselves weak and adopting a posture of weakness. But that's actually the place that the Lord actually works. He doesn't work when we're strong. You know, when I'm weak, then I'm strong, Paul says, and my grace Mm -hmm. is sufficient for you. And so I I think a powerful church to the world looks like a weak church. We have these treasures in jars of clay, but this is to show that the surpassing worth belongs to God. Like, this is a pattern over and over and over in the Bible. Um, this is the pattern of the Jesus Christ being born, you know, in Galilee to, um, you know, to a, a young woman, like out of wedlock, you know, from a corner of the earth no one cared about. Like, that's the whole point. Yeah. And... So today, you know, what we can do to adopt this posture of humility is to pray. But God works through that. Yeah. And so these stories... This this trips us up, though, because we so easily think that we're causing God to do something by praying. Yeah. But it's, you know, that's just getting the cart before the horse, right? And God uses means. Yeah. And the means he uses involve his, his people. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that, you know... Because hey, if we uh, if we all get together and start praying, then God's gonna have to do something. Yeah. But like you said, if people have that desire, then God's already working. Yeah. In their hearts. Yeah. But He does. He uses the prayers of His saints. That's yeah. Just that's Scripture's very clear on that. But it doesn't mean that we're changing His mind or anything like that. But that somehow our wills are aligned to His. And that's working his purposes out. Yeah, and, and sincere prayer that aligns with his will acknowledges him for who he is and are and is aware of our own weaknesses. So I would say God can respond to prayer in a way that doesn't confuse uh things as if we are the ones in charge. Yeah. Because if you're praying as if you're in charge, you're not really praying. Right? Like yeah, you, yeah. that's not a sincere prayer. A sincere prayer is implicitly an acknowledgement of weakness. And an acknowledgement of inferiority to God, that he's a superior, that he is the almighty, that we are not. So if it's a genuine prayer, it can't be construed to be something like controlling God, like the pagans do, who think that it is by their many words that that God listens. And our God doesn't listen because of our words. He listens because of our need, and and he's pleased to display his power in that. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, again, back to the revival conversation, um, Pastor Steve gave so many examples of revival. And when we talk about um, dominion and, and the rule of Christ extending to every sphere, well, that only happens through revival. Like that, and I mean that in a technical sense. It only happens as hum- as sinners are converted, right? As they're born again. There's no the only way that you see the kingdom of heaven is unless God reveals it to you. Jesus says that unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. That's right. And so, what we need is for dead people to be made alive. Well, that's something that we can't do. That's right. We need conversion. And so we pray for that. We pray that God would open eyes. We pray that God would empower the ministry of the word. We pray that God would use our lives as a witness. But we are praying for God to do the work of revival. And when you've seen massive society 
statewide transformation um, as we have throughout history uh, in the in the West, and maybe we'll do a, an, an episode on revival with Pastor Steve. Yeah, that'd be great. But like mm-hmm. culture, like Britain was radically transformed by revival. I mean, right. I've read historians say that the only reason they didn't go down the path of the French, which they were very worried about, just across the channel, the French Revolution, mm-hmm. and there were revolutions going on everywhere around the world Russia, following yeah. this. Yeah, Russia, South America, in the Caribbean, like this had a this 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 revolutionary spirit, which is fundamentally unbelief. Um but it didn't take hold in England, though it was so close. Mm-hmm. And they were genuinely worried it would and almost expected it to. Well, why not? Well, one church historian I read said because um, of a revival, hmm. like the English revival. Is like that the time of Whitfield? And, I, that, don't, I don't know the that? exact, all the preachers are at the time, but there was a, a renewal that had happened previously or was happening at the time that served as a buffer against that. Mm-hmm. Because... Those revolutions, not that there were not genuine problems in society, but it's wicked man seeking to overcome wicked man. Yep. And I mean, the, what's more clear in the French Revolution, right? Like you take over and you kill everyone, but then everyone steps up and kills you. Yep. And then, uh, uh, you know, the, the, t- the people who overthrew the tyrants become the tyrants. Like yep. there's no answer here. There's no well, answer when, in human when, yeah. reform. The whole, the whole reason, the raison d'être of the revolution, so to speak, is overthrowing established order. Yes. You're not, it's not reformation. No, it's not. Right. Reformation is different than revolution. Yes. Re- revolution is, this is the way it's always been, and we're just going to tear it down and build something new. Well, yes. if that's what you're planning on doing, yeah. well, they're just going to tear you down. Yes. Once you're done tearing down something else. Yeah. You're building with the same materials. Yeah. And that's the problem. But God does not build with those materials. Yeah. God's kingdom is built on his word and by his spirit, and it's fundamentally different. And we, what we need for the, the, the task of dominion to be completed, and as we work for that in Canada, is revival. Yeah. And that's going to happen through the prayers of God's people. It's going to happen home to home, individual to individual, church to church, and God can work out from that. And we we pray for, for a massive revival. We pray for thousands of people, as in the book of Acts, to be added to their numbers in a week. Like, we would love that to happen. I mean, yeah, overall, I'd love that to happen. Yeah. It'd be a challenge. But as it was for the early church, yeah, it was a challenge <laughs> for the church too. Yeah. Um, but we need to, I guess, we can just maybe close off on um, the task of dominion requires the prayers of the people of God, mm-hmm. and this is this is what my encouragement to our listeners is, and um, our viewers is is let's let's commit ourselves to praying that um, that our Father's name would be honored and mm-hmm. that His kingdom would come and that His will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we genuinely ask that with in weakness and with trust and in faith, he's pleased to answer that prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and we're getting a taste in our country right now of what it's like to live under a tyrannical government. Yeah. And so we should all be just longing for that, the rule of Christ, that good, just righteous rule. Yes. And so we ought to be praying for that every day. Yeah, Paul says to Timothy, um, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Mm -hmm. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so that's practical, you know, when we we should be praying more than we are complaining about things. Mm-hmm. There are serious injustices to confront and there's a constant litany of abuse and um, just stories of wickedness. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we therefore need to pray. We need to pray for repentance. We need to pray that all of those who lead our country locally, like municipally, provincially, federally repent. Yeah, and believe the gospel. And if if we're content with some policy changes, I mean, we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. So, 
Let's yeah. commit to that. Excellent. Uh, you uh, got any good books going on the go right now? Um, I'm trying to think of what I'm reading. Honestly, I've been mainly reading commentaries. Yeah. On Acts. So. Sounds exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's super exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, if anybody's looking for a good read or a good listen, the uh, Ruler of Kings, Joe Boots' latest book. Nice. Is available on Audible. Yeah. Narrated by yours truly. You so may you may recognize the sound of that sultry the voice. Dulcet Doe. <laughs> Jeremy Boyd. <laughs> Ruler of Kings <laughs> by Joseph Boot. <laughs> I anyway. love how people, it's funny because people who know Joe know that he has an accent. And I think that, I mean, he's a brilliant man. He's a, from what I know, a great guy. Uh, the accent definitely helps. Oh yeah. Like it, 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 you just do sound smarter when you have an accent. Yes. And I mean, he doesn't need an accent to sound brilliant because he just is, but. It I tried narrating helps. it with an accent, Did but you I'm, actually? Just, I'm just not good enough. <laughs> Bro, that'd be so funny if you sent them the final copy. Like It's all done in a hours. Cockney accent. <laughs> Dude, you made the book sound worse. What's going on? <laughs> no, you got a, you, you definitely have a great voice for it. So how was that process? Uh, it, was, it was really good. Um, it took so... It's about a six and a half hour mm -hmm. listen if mm -hmm. you listen to it at one time speed. And it took about 40 hours to produce. Yeah. Including like the reading, the editing, the yeah. um, going back over it. But I could probably cut that down next time. I think I'd change a couple things I did. But uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a fun process. That's awesome. It's a really fun process. So you think you would do that again? I like think we're planning audiobook? on doing it again. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. The hope is eventually he'll do his uh, uh, second or third edition of Mission of God. Yeah. We can put that one to uh to audio so. yeah that'd be great that would be a long project that's it's a beast it is a, a beast. beast of a book but yeah. yeah anyway anybody who's on audible check out ruler of kings yeah it's a good it's a really good important book i think people would like it great yeah i also just got a book in the mail today um called regnum calorum okay it's the latin title uh and it's i can't even remember the name of the author charlie something from Reformed Theological Seminary, but it's a detailed analysis of uh, the different millennial positions from the early church fathers. Okay. And sort of what they thought and even some rabbinic, early rabbinic mm. interpretations of the Old Testament. So I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Apparently it's like kind of the uh, the gold standard. He did a ton of research on this book. So mm -hmm. and it's not even that big, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's so, great. Yeah. Well, you got any final words? No, I think that's uh, I think that's good. Again, if you want to check us out on YouTube, like and subscribe, Twitter. We're on uh, Rumble too, in case uh, you just don't want to support YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. And Dominion Press at sub dot substack dot com. That's right. Well, we'll leave you with this until next time. Maybe we'll get a, an interview or a Dominion Minute for next time. But uh, for now, we'll leave you with this. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. 